Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Encounter Community Church virtual service. My name is Ken Ballard Jr. I am the pastor here at Encounter Community Church. And I just wanted to take a moment real quickly just to say thank you. Again, we cannot say thank you enough for those of you that invest in the ministry of Encounter. We had our mobile food bank this week, and so we were able to feed a total of 152 families, which represented 600 people that we had a chance to be able to serve food this week. And again, that's because of your generosity. And I just wanted to share something really cool that happened this week as well. Because on Wednesday, when we passed out the food, uh, we had actually ran out of food. And we had 12 more families that showed up at the church that needed more food. And thanks to the food that we had on hand, because of your generosity and the generosity of a community member who did a food drive that donated extra food to the church, we were able to feed 12 more families that arrived after we had run out of food for the mobile food bank. So again, that kind of generosity is because of you. So thank you for your investment into Encounter that allows us to be the kind of church that God has called us to be. And I cannot wait for COVID to end so we are able to step out into the community and get more involved in the community, making these kinds of differences. But it's because of people like you who volunteer your time and volunteer your finances that allows us to be able to make that difference. And so for those of you that want to be able to give here at Encounter, uh, there are several ways that you could do that. One is you could do it through uh, sending a check to Encounter Community Church, 18749 Christian Boulevard in Torrance, California. Uh, another way that you could do that is via giving online, and you can do that by, uh, by going to encountercommunity.church, uh, clicking the link that says online giving. You can give there. That link will also be provided in the description, so you can just click that as well. And then finally, if you wanted to give via text, you could just send an amount. Uh, you just text the amount that you want to give to this number here for both texting as well as for online giving. If it's your first time doing it, there'll be a process that you'll go through in order to do so, just like online shopping. But just want to let you know with the information that you give, we do not use that for spamming purposes. It's just at the end of the year, we can send out tax, tax contribution records for those of you that want to claim your donations on your taxes. But again, thank you so much. And I just wanted to ask this question. What is the it factor? Have you ever thought about that? Like there, there are just certain people that have what they would call the it factor. And we're doing this series called Becoming, How to Become the Greatest of All Time. And everyone who is that, who, everyone who is the goat has that it. Well, we've been talking about how to do that biblically. And today, Daniel is going to be speaking, our youth leader is going to be speaking, and he's going to be talking about the greatest virtue, that one element that gives us the it factor that allows us to be the greatest of all time in different roles of our lives. Well, with that in mind, let me go ahead and open this up prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time to be able to gather this morning. We pray that your hand will be upon the rest of the service. We pray that you would use this moment for us to be able to examine our lives to be able to see where we're at in developing this it factor into our lives. And all these things we ask in your name, amen. So again, thank you so much for being a part of the virtual service. If you're looking for ways to be able to continue to be involved here at Encounter, just feel free to watch the announcements. They let you know what's going on. And then after the announcements are done, Ariel's gonna lead us in a couple of songs of worship. But thank you. We're so excited to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much for joining us for the Encounter Community Church virtual service. We're so excited to have you with us. Here are the things that are coming up at Encounter. For those of you who may not know, we have started to have our outdoor worship services once again. We meet in the parking lot on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. If you'd love to join us, wear a mask, bring a chair, come on out. We keep it as safe as possible by practicing social distancing. So we would love to see you there. For those of you that are uncomfortable with gathering at this point, we will continue to provide a virtual service for you. In just a matter of a couple weeks, we'll be having our outdoor Easter service. That's right, Easter service will be here on April 4th, 10.30 a.m. We'd love to have you come on out for that. If you know of anyone else who may be looking for an outdoor service, feel free to invite them to come and join us as well. Then following the service, we will have a COVID-safe Easter egg hunt for all the kids that do come. 
For those of you who would prefer a different option, we will also provide a virtual Easter service for you and your family as well. And with that in mind, we will also be doing a virtual Easter egg hunt throughout the service, and we'll be announcing the prize for those coming up soon. For those of you who opt to have the virtual service and you have children, just wanna let you know we would love to be able to bless your kids with an Easter basket. So please let us know by March the 28th who you are and the names of your kids. That way we can bless you and we can work it out to be able to get you an Easter basket for your children. On April the 14th, we will have our mobile food bank. Again, it's a way for us to be able to meet the needs of those who are in our community. If you are hungry or know of someone else who's hungry, please let them know. Again, that's from 9 till 11 a.m. If you would love to volunteer, feel free to show up at 8. If you'd like to stay connected to the things that are happening here at Encounter, text at sign up ECC to 81010. It's just a way for us to be connected through what is called the Remind app. So we do not have access to your personal information. It's just a way for you to be updated on the things that are happening here at Encounter. If you would like to follow along with the service, please place your phone in camera mode, aim it at the QR code that you see on the screen, a link will pop up. You can follow along with that link to be able to follow along with the message for today. Just to let you know that we want to try to keep our outdoor services as touch-free as possible. So we do make our music available from Sunday mornings on this app as well. So all you'd have to do is scroll past the lyrics to the actual notes and you can have that to be able to follow along with Daniel's message. Again, thank you for joining us. We're so excited to have you with us this morning. And Ariel's gonna lead us in a couple songs that we can sing to God.
ears to hear you so clearly. God, we just love you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Encounter Community and our online church service. Uh, we're just so glad you're here. Um, God is good, God is great, and He is doing great things in myself, and I know within you, within our town. It is just a, it's a good day today. I, I really do believe that. But uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Daniel. I'm, the, I'm one of the youth leaders here. My wife and I help run the youth program here at Encounter Community. And um, we're going to continue along with our sermon series about being the goat, you know, greatest of all time, not literal farm animals, but the goat, yes. But uh, uh, this is going to be uh, week three of our sermon series, and um, Ken's done an awesome job over the last two weeks of just bringing things up. And so we're going to talk about today about the greatest virtue and what that is, what it looks like. But before we dive in anymore, I want to pray over this message. And if you would, just pray with me. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this time. I thank you for all that you're doing, Lord. And, and I thank you for the opportunity to minister to those who are, are watching this right now. Father, I pray that you use me, that you speak through me, and you allow this message to just say what it is you want to say, Father. For I am nothing, Lord, but a messenger of you. So I, I just ask God that you just speak to the hearts of those who are listening tonight and today and whenever they do decide to listen to the message. And in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Okay. Well, again, continuing with our sermon series of being the goat. Ken talked about what is greatness in our last message and that the type of greatness you pursue could either make you or break you. And I want to make uh, an emphasis on the greatest virtue to follow after that allows us to become great. Because that's kind of what we all want eventually, is to be great in what we do, but in a sense of humility and, and, and the likeness of God behind what it is that we do, that His humility then follows behind us, and that we follow it, right? So before we dive in much more, I want to talk about a story about a guy and his idea of what his life was. So there was this guy, right? And he was in a park. And he was just not having a good day. He was really sad and he's sitting down and people around the park noticed him and they saw him and they notified a park ranger about this individual and said, hey, there's a guy over there and he looks just like he's not doing well. Maybe you want to go talk to him. So the park ranger says, I'll go ahead and talk with him. He goes over there and he says, hey, pal, he's like, uh, everything doing OK? Uh, individuals in the park are concerned. And he's like, I I'm not doing well. And the uh, Park ranger says, uh, anything I can do to help? He's like, well, no, not really. He's like, well, what's, what's wrong? So the guy tells the park ranger, three weeks ago, I got a letter from the IRS, and uh, they said that I have been overpaying my taxes for nearly 20 years, and they're going to pay back my taxes and give me interest that equates to nearly $2 million back to me. Three weeks ago, that happened. And then two weeks ago, I found out that the car my friend gave me, an old junker jalopy, was on a recall that required the manufacturer to replace the car entirely for free with a brand new car. And then just last week, I got a letter saying that my information was accidentally entered in some sweet stakes to win a house in Malibu. And I won. The park ranger looks at him and he's like, I, I'm super confused why you're sad right now. You've won a house in Malibu. You received a brand new car and nearly $2 million for reasons I'm not sure of. And I don't know what's happening. The guy looks at the park ranger and says, you know why I'm sad? He's like, I'd love to know. He says, nothing's happened this week. Why is it that we're so fixated on the now? Why is it that we find ourselves in a place where it's so easy to forget what happened and not remember where we came from, the things that we possess, and we get fixated on where things are today only? I have a theory that why things are continually getting a little more rough around the edges in situations like that, and I think social media plays a role in that. Mind you, I think social media is a good thing 
That's how you are able to watch me right now because of social media. But unfortunately, there's these situations where people will post things and they will post things that you then become jealous of. You compare where you're at to others and you forget that you have the house, you have the car, you have the money, but those all happened in the past. And where you're at right now, nothing happened today. And you find yourself in a place where you're confused and you're frustrated and you're just kind of angry because the neighbor next door or your friend from high school that you haven't seen in 20 years, they had something happen to them today. And because of that, you're in a place of just not feeling well. There's an old saying that says, comparison is the thief of joy. I think there's truth to that. But what I want to touch on is what does Scripture say in regards to finding a virtue that we can hold on to that won't allow us to be blinded by unsatisfaction or kind of short-changed, feeling short-changed in life? Scripture talks about love, about allowing the greatest virtue being love in our life. When we look at Jesus directly, we see him and we see what he did. We see about the avenues he took on his walk here on earth. And we understand this. When Jesus was on the cross, the thing that held him there wasn't money, wasn't power, wasn't success, wasn't vacations, wasn't all these things that we idolize in our world. The things that we hold as a virtue, unfortunately, nowadays, are the thing to strive towards. It was love. Love held him to the cross. It wasn't nails. It wasn't rope. It wasn't anything. Love held him there. He could have easily came down from that cross if he wanted to. But he knew the value in you, the value in me, and he held that. And he said, because I love you, I'm not coming down. And I'm going to make this sacrifice happen so that one day you can look back at me and know that I loved you this much because of what I did then. And knowing that, Knowing that money and power and success were nothing in regards to why he stayed there. Why do we hold such value in those things? Why? I think it's important that we turn to Scripture and lean on the idea that love as a virtue is where we build our foundation and we hold it and we hold it tight and we never let that go. When Jesus was asked during the time of his you know, three years of ministering to others here on earth, what was the greatest commandment ever? What was something that we should do, something we should always hold tight to? It was love the Lord your God with everything you have and to love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. Those are it. It's that simple. Love God, love people. And if you can do those things, pretty much you're following in line with what God's asked you to do. But we sometimes forget that. But I want to understand is, why did God, Jesus, God, you know, that whole Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the three in one, fixate so heavily on love? Why love? And I have three ideas into the reason of why love was chosen and why we should also allow love to be a virtue that we don't let go of. Love resembles God. That's the first one. That's two. That's the first one. First one. <laughs> Love resembles God. When we look in Scripture, we see time and time again where love resembled God. The cross, John 3.16, you know, all these different things that we see. But there's stories specifically in the Gospels that talk about where Jesus was doing his ministering over the course of those three years, and instances came up that tested Jesus, tested him, and the religious leaders of the day wanted him to fail. And in one instance where this took place and where this happened, he was tested to the point where others would have maybe fallen, but God used love, Jesus used love to get himself out of it. And I want to talk about that. I don't want to read it, but I want to actually allow you to hear it for what it was. There was a time where the religious leaders of the day came to Jesus with a woman who was caught in adultery. 
And he brought this woman, they, they brought this woman to Jesus' feet and said, this woman has committed a cardinal sin. She, she should be stoned to death. We should kill her right now. What do you think, Jesus? Jesus turns to the religious leaders of the day and he says to them, he who is without sin cast the first stone. All the men there dropped the stones that they brought to kill this woman and left, knowing that they were with sin too. And mind you now, Jesus is there with this woman who was caught in adultery. And he is then left with the decision, do I, because of who I am without sin, kill this woman with the stones that are here in this room, which I should be able to do because I'm God, or do I do something else? Do I use love? He tells that woman, go sin no more. Here's your second chance. Go. You're not condemned. Leave. I love you. What does that show us? That when somebody was in the wrong, Jesus showed them love. He told her, sin no more. He didn't say, keep doing what you're doing, good person. You know, but ultimately he said, go sin no more because I love you. Your second chance is here. I want to look at another instance in the Bible where Jesus was faced with another situation. I'm not really a thin individual per se, but I do know this. One day I might be, but probably not anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> but I know food is a vital part of of the existence of where I'm at. And I love food. I love eating. I love it. And I know it's important for others. There's so much conversation that can happen at the dinner table. It's a fun time to gather and just be there with others who you care about and who you love. And food brings that sometimes within that, that, that circumstance. And Jesus knows that. So there was a time where Jesus was ministering to individuals during that three-year span when he was here on earth with his disciples. And there was the crowds that were there to listen to him, preach the gospel, and there was a crowd of over 5,000 people, and they were hungry after he finished preaching. And instead of God, Jesus, I'm sorry, I keep saying God, but Jesus, same thing. Instead of Jesus saying, well, I preached, you guys take care. He realized the value in saying, we need to feed these people because I love them. And there's something that comes from the idea of feeding somebody that shows them the love that you truly do have for them. He told his disciples, we will figure out a way to make this happen. I will make a miracle come to pass because it's important that I show these people I love them. And he did. And everybody there was fed beyond anything they've ever had before. There was leftovers. It was an amazing time. And we look at that story and we got to realize love allowed that to happen. Are we called to love like that? Are we called to have that type of love? I want to look at John 13, 33 through 35. It says this, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How will people know that we are individuals that are separate from this world? That we have an answer to a problem that they have if they can't even see it in the actions that we take? The Bible's telling us right here that love through Christ is how they see Christ in us. That we need to love one another. Jesus is talking to disciples in this verse. He's telling them, People are going to be broken. People are going to be hurt, but they need to know that you're different. And the only way they're going to know that is if you love them. Love one another. Allow that to be a representation of who I am in you. Let that be the greatest virtue to stand on. Love one another. Number two out of the virtues to talk about today are the ideas behind the greatest virtue is love leaves room for mistakes. Love leaves room for mistakes. Do we believe that? Do we know that? Do we trust that? The Bible has 
just story after story of God's love reconciling issues that happened. But our culture today forgets that. It forgets that there is a thing called unconditional love through Christ. A love that is never ending, a love that is everlasting, a love that will last long, 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 long times, longer than we can ever think of. I, I don't know other way to say it. It's just, it's just long. It's just, it is, his love's forever, right? And it's unconditional. And we put our own spin on the idea that love is conditional, that love is this thing that I can fall out of. Love is this thing that I had for you at one point in time, but I don't have anymore. That ultimately, love is something that will change over time in a way that directly represents me not loving you anymore. Why is that? Why do we have that in our hearts and in our minds? Our society twists that in so many ways, and it's really sad, and it's unfortunate. But I want to look at a story in the Bible. And mind you, there's, there's tons of them, but this one in particular where we look at an individual who happens to be a disciple of Jesus. And this disciple is named Peter. And Peter is a very vibrant disciple. And he is very ambitious. And he is faced with a situation that is rough. But the situation here is he is trying to tell Jesus, I love you more than anything. And Jesus says, I know you do, but you're you're going to fall and it's okay. And Peter ultimately is like, no way, man, that's not who I am. And I want to dive into that scripture right now and explore what it is. So if you will, read with me, if you would like, in John 13, 36 through 38. And we're going to explore what actually took place between Peter and Jesus. And we can see how love was forgiving in a way that maybe many of us, many of us don't understand but hopefully one day will. In John 13, 36 through 38, it says this, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. This is Peter saying this. I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So again, I want to assess what's going on here. The time when Jesus is about to part from his disciples, he's about to be crucified on the cross, is coming up. It is soon. And he's, he knows this is happening. Jesus knows. and He's telling his disciples, look, I'm not going to be here. You have to understand that where I'm going, you can't follow right now, but you'll follow eventually. And Peter doesn't even listen to that. He doesn't realize, but he, he's ambitious. He loves the Lord. I believe he truly does love the Lord in, in a way that he believes is unconditional. And the fact that he said, I will die for you. I will, my heart will stop beating for you, Lord. I believe that to be true at that moment. He did believe that. But sometimes our love will hit a speed bump. It doesn't mean that our love has been taken away. All it means is that possibly it's just a little derailed, but it still exists. And what I love about this story is it paints an awesome picture of how God is, how Jesus' love just permeates in through the things that he does. So mind you, this is before the actual crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Then the crucifixion takes place, and before he's actually nailed to the cross and he is being beaten, Jesus is being beaten, Peter literally witnesses that taking place and individuals around him are asking him, don't you know who Jesus is? And Peter denied him three times, denied the fact that he knew him three separate occasions. What Jesus said actually happened. Mind you, Peter was saying, I, I love you so much I would die for you. But when the actual chance came up to do it, he didn't. I can only imagine what Peter was going through. I, I don't know. I, it's just, it's so heavy to think that what he was witnessing, to, to just be like, I'm jumping in with you, Lord. I'm jumping in with you. Who? It's hard. And ultimately, Jesus died on the cross. 
because he loved us, and three days later, resurrected from the dead. But then, in John 21, 15, something happens. And I want to dive into that right now. We're going to talk about it a little bit. John 21, 15 says this. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of God, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I remember hearing this when I was younger, actually reading the scripture, hearing it you know, in messages, and not really understanding it in its entirety. It makes Jesus sound like a deaf person almost, or he has like a hearing problem. You know, Do you love me, Peter? I, I can't hear you. What, do you love me, Peter? What's going on? You know, it's this idea of, of why is the question continually being asked? And the, the reason being, and our English language doesn't do a great job of having every word that the Bible had in this original transcript. Originally, the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew languages, and they had words for love that we just don't have in our language. And the word for love for us is just love, L-O-V-E, that's it. We have our one word. But when this was initially written, it was written with different types of love in mind. And so I want to re-read this or paraphrase it for you in a way that makes a little more sense and we can also see what God's love truly is like. Okay, so at the time when the Bible was initially written, there was the Eros styled of love, which is kind of more of the um, bodily type love, more something shared between a man and a woman in regards to marriage and like the, the erotic styled of love, Eros, where they get the word erotic from, that one, right? Then there's Phileo, right? The, the more of the brotherly style of love. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit different. It's kind of how you would love a friend or a neighbor, or kind of that style of love. And then there's the agape love. It's the love that is unconditional. It's spiritual. It, it's the love that's spoken of so much within the Bible. It's the love that God has for us. So when this initially was happening, Jesus comes to Peter. Mind you, Peter, three days prior, denied the fact that he even knew him. He goes to Peter and he says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally, Peter? Peter responds back and says, Lord, I, I, I phileo you. I, I love you like my brother. Jesus then says, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Jesus knew what Peter was capable of because Jesus still loved him unconditionally. Peter wasn't ready to say it. He wasn't. He was still feeling the guilt of what he had done just three days ago. But Jesus there in the flesh was willing to say, I still love you. And he brought himself down. And the last time he asked Peter, do you love me? He met Peter on his own field. And he said to Peter, Peter, do you love me like a brother? Do you phileo me? Peter, I'm sure with his head down, probably said, Lord, you know I phileo you. He said, feed my sheep. Jesus was willing to come from here where the bar was set with always with Jesus. It's always up here. And he knew that Peter was here. He said, Peter, come up here. Peter's like, I can't. He's like, okay, I'll meet you. Love allows room for mistake. And you meet people where they are. And you forgive. And you work. And you allow that essence of a progression to take place within love because that's how great it is. But thirdly, I want to look at this. Love gives me a mission. Love gives me a mission. You know, back in like the... World War I, World War II days, or even like Korean, the Korean War, or Vietnam, all that other stuff, a term that was used often was 
well, I'm in the service. You don't really hear it as often, but that was a term that was used with military officials or anybody who was in the form of any kind of military, you know, whether it be the army or the, or the Marines or the Navy, whatever it was, it was, I'm in the service. And the idea was you're in service to your country, right? We as Christians, we as individuals who choose to make our greatest virtue love are in the service but we are in service to our Father, to the Lord, to God Almighty. We are in service. And we are on one of the greatest rescue missions ever in the history of mankind to allow the lost people of this world to know that there is a God in heaven who loves them. And they can see that through us. We're in the service. Just thought you should know that. But uh, there's a scripture that says something that allows us to know what our responsibilities are with being in the service. Mark 16, 15 says this. He said to them, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That is known as the Great Commission, something that we're supposed to do with the skill set that the Lord has given us. So if he says, love one another so that people will know that you're my disciples. And in addition to that, with that love, go into the world and preach to everyone about it. What do we do? We, we, we have a clear picture on what our, 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 our responsibilities are supposed to be. You know, this world is broken. Go anywhere and you can see it. Go to a grocery store, go to a park. I mean, go to work, go to a family member's house. I mean, we are in a broken world. And it's, it's, it's sad at times when we look at it. But you know, there's ones who are out there who never knew Christ. And it's our job to meet them where they are. You know, there's ones who rejected Christ and said, I'm done. And there's ones that feel that Christ rejected them for whatever reason. And there's, the list goes on and on of individuals who find themselves in places where God just isn't there for them and they don't know what it's like to even have him in their hearts. But through our actions, as making love the greatest virtue, they can see Christ through us. There's a, you know, the idea of, letting your testimony be seen every day. And at times, <laughs> allow words to be part of it. You know, it's, it's, it's a funny saying, and I've said it before, but I think it's important that we allow the actions that we take to be what makes us different. That ultimately we can find peace in what we do because of the love we hold on to. That others will see it and ask us about it. Or they'll trust us when we tell them what's going on. I really do believe that it's important to minister to people, not just because the Bible said it, but because I, myself, am a product of somebody ministering to me. And I think I'm not alone in that. But I know that growing up in a Christian home and then falling away from where Christ wanted me to be and then bringing myself to a place of saying, I don't know if I want to be a part of Christ anymore because of circumstances that I brought myself into. I was believing lies that weren't even in existence. I was allowing myself to go down a path that was dark and destructive. And though God never turned his back on me, I turned my back on him. It wasn't until an individual and his wife came to me, this married couple, and said, can we help you? Maybe not, they didn't really say they helped me, but they showed it. They came into my life, allowed God's love in them to be seen through my eyes. And it took effort on their part. It took time, money. I mean, we went to eat. I mean, other things that, that happened, vacations for that matter that they allowed me to be part of, other things that brought me to a place to know that God exists in the lives of people and that he is real. And if it wasn't for that couple to minister to me directly, I guarantee you I would not be here today. 
So I can't emphasize enough on how important it is to allow love to be a virtue that we stand on and allow that virtue to be seen by others so that others can find Christ through who we are because of the virtues we decided to go after. I, 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 I'm honest, folks. I know I wouldn't be here right now. And so I, I, I hold on to that. I hold on to that and I hold on to that. And I, I, I know it's so important to let other people know that Christ has done something in your life. And the love that He, shed, that the love that he shares with us is something that we need to share with others. You know, in conclusion here, when it comes to becoming the goat, it's important that we follow the ultimate goat. You know, when we're looking for something to follow after, when we're looking for an idea to be a part of, there's already the greatest of all time at our, at our doorstep, and all we got to do is just open it and allow them in. Will we do that? Can we do that? I just can't emphasize it enough. I don't want us to be fixated on the idea that things that don't matter take a virtue in our life over a place of something that does. Let love be the ultimate virtue that you stand on to turn you into the goat in any situation you take on. Remember that. The ultimate goat of all time chose love. We should too. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for this message. And Father, I just ask that you allow your spirit to just minister to all those who are watching right now, Father. I pray that their hearts will take in the idea that love is great and your love is what is great and that we never let that go. And uh, ultimately, Father, may we just seek you daily and may others see our works, Lord, that you've allowed in our lives, our, our, our love for you in our lives. Lord, may others see that and want to follow you because of it. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Comfort for family. Protection while we sleep.
Daniel, thank you so much for that message. And I pray that we are all encouraged as well as challenged by it. That we're taking this moment to really be able to examine the love that exists in our lives. You know, one of the things that we've been encouraging you to do over the course of this series, and we're going to continue to encourage you to do it, is to do an, an assessment of the level of love that is in your life. So, so what does that look like? Well, again, it's based upon the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. At Encounter, again, we say love up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor, so we say love out as yourself, so we say love in. And what we've been encouraging you to do is at the end of the day is to sit down with pen and paper and just ask yourself, how did I do with loving up? How did I connect with God today? How did I disconnect with God today. Loving out. How did I do with loving others? How did I do with loving my family? How did I do with loving friends? How did I do with loving my coworkers? Are there ways that I could have done better at that? Is there anyone that's far from God that I purposely showed love to? Is there anyone that is struggling, that is broken, that I purposely showed love to? Is there anyone uh, that is going through some difficulties, that is struggling and wrestling financially, and that's poor, that I showed love to intentionally? How did I do with that today? And then love in. What steps of growth, personal growth, did I take today? Where can I be and, and, and where can I go? So, so just to kind of examine that, how am I doing and where am I going? And so, and then at the end of that is to ask yourself, what can I do differently tomorrow? I'll tell you, with this process for me, again, one of the things that, that I've been working on is how, when I get home, my tendency after I'm done working, is to disconnect. And I disconnect from my family, and I just kind of sit down, and I just watch television. And, and so I've been really working on that. So this tool has really helped me. How did I do with loving my family this evening? Did I spend time with my kids? Did I spend time with my wife? And then I can kind of gauge that. And then what can I do differently tomorrow? How can I plan that? So this is the way this tool works. So what I'm saying is this is a great way for us to take Christianity from being up here to being real and being practical. So it's my prayer that you do that. So I want to challenge you this week. Give that a try. Again, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, please either like or subscribe to our channel. That way when we post new things, you'll be one of the first ones to be able to see and be notified about it. And then also... As a reminder, encounters about three things, love up, love out, love in, and I already covered those. But then after we're done, there's going to be some questions if you want to discuss and talk about that with a family member or friend if they're watching it with you. And then also uh, the announcements will play once again if you've missed them. So take care, God bless you, and have a wonderful week.
Thank you so much for joining us for the Encounter Community Church virtual service. We're so excited to have you with us. Here are the things that are coming up at Encounter. For those of you who may not know, we have started to have our outdoor worship services once again. We meet in the parking lot on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. If you'd love to join us, wear a mask, bring a chair, come on out. We keep it as safe as possible by practicing social distancing. So we would love to see you there. For those of you that are uncomfortable with gathering at this point, we will continue to provide a virtual service for you. In just a matter of a couple of weeks, we will be having our outdoor Easter service. That's right, Easter service will be here on April 4th, 10.30 a.m. We'd love to have you come on out for that. If you know of anyone else who may be looking for an outdoor service, feel free to invite them to come and join us as well. And then following the service, we will have a COVID safe Easter egg hunt for all the kids that do come. For those of you who would prefer a different option, we will also provide a virtual Easter service for you and your family as well. And with that in mind, we will also be doing a virtual Easter egg hunt throughout the service and we'll be announcing the prize for those coming up soon. For those of you who opt to have the virtual service and you have children, just wanna let you know we would love to be able to bless your kids with an Easter basket. So please let us know by March the 28th who you are and the names of your kids. That way we can bless you and we can work it out to be able to get you an Easter basket for your children. On April the 14th, we will have our mobile food bank. Again, it's a way for us to be able to meet the needs of those who are in our community. If you are hungry or know of someone else who's hungry, please let them know. Again, that's from 9 till 11 a.m. If you would love to volunteer, feel free to show up at 8. If you'd like to stay connected to the things that are happening here, at Encounter, text at sign up ECC to 81010. It's just a way for us to be connected through what is called the Remind app. So we do not have access to your personal information. It's just a way for you to be updated on the things that are happening here at Encounter. If you would like to follow along with the service, please place your phone in camera mode, aim it at the QR code that you see on the screen, and a link will pop up. You can follow along with that link to be able to follow along with the message for today. Just to let you know that we want to try to keep our outdoor services as touch-free as possible. So we do make our music available from Sunday mornings on this app as well. So all you'd have to do is scroll past the lyrics to the actual notes and you can have that to be able to follow along with Daniel's message. Again, thank you for joining us. We're so excited to have you with us this morning and Ariel's gonna lead us in a couple songs that we can sing to God. <laughs> 